right, we're heading to the book of First John. This is part two of a message that I started last Sunday called Relearning Love and uh, didn't get through everything because I got in, as Bishop Noel Jones used to say, intoxicated with the exuberance of my own verbosity and uh, <laughs> ran out of time. Amen. So we're going to try to get the rest of this in. But it is, uh, in my mind, a very important and appropriate part of what I believe we who are followers of Jesus must contend with as we, as we continue to think of how ought we to live in light of resurrection. Uh, if you weren't here last Sunday, First John is uh, one of the letters that is either attributed to the Apostle John, who was one of the four disciples, I'm sorry, 12 disciples, but one of the inner circle disciples. Uh, it is also attributed to uh, another writer who is uh, called John the Evangelist, who uh, may have been a disciple of the Apostle uh, John and, and uh, pulled together some of his uh, themes and admonitions towards the end of his life. As you heard me say last Sunday, uh, John and many of the apostles wrote these letters under the guard and watch of a uh, prison guard. They were incarcerated. Uh, they wrote and they uh, delivered these divine revelations and admonitions and instructions to the people, mostly as uh, incarcerated individuals. And we do believe that uh, it is a great gift and a blessing to be reminded that your positionality does not always uh, determine, define, or exhaust uh, your connection to God. I was, uh, the other lectionary passage for today that I was wrestling with uh, before I continued into this passage is uh, John chapter number 15. And it's a great passage of scripture uh, because it says that I am the vine, Jesus is talking, and you are the branches. And uh, we cannot produce or bear good fruit apart from the vine. It reminded me that we are all connected to the Most High, to the work and the, the love and the extension of God. And yet, how many of you know that sometimes you can be in a situation, a place in your life, a season where it feels like you are isolated, where you are alone, where you are without help? Uh, I want to offer to you today that there is a force, a, a, a source, a spirit that connects us to God. And I want to also say verbosely that uh, if we can tap in more intensely and intently to this connection, it may and should and will give you sustaining power no matter where you find yourself. Amen. That you could be in a mountain high or a valley low, but your connection to God can sustain you in ways that you have never imagined. And it is in this way that I hope today's message will give us a bit of an instructional framework on how we are to live in light of today's concerns. First John chapter number four, verse seven it's also worth saying that, <clears throat> you know, sometimes people who claim to be Christian expect people who are not Christian to follow their sacred texts. And I think it's really important to just say that what I'm about to read today presupposes that you are connected to God through Christ. And there's a special admonition for us. It's a special calling for us. It is almost to say that if no one else in the world does this, there ought to be followers of Jesus who do. And I pray that we receive it in this way. Verse number seven, dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God and everyone who loves has been born of God. And knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. 
In verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. Talking about Jesus. Verse 10, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us. I'm going to say that again. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent God's son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, God didn't just love us. He so loved us. Amen. That so is an accentuating so. Like, you know, there's levels to God's love or there's levels to love. And God's love is so significant since God so loved us. Listen, we also ought to love one another. Now, that art is something else. You know, when you look at somebody, they say, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> Right, art is like now you know what, what's wrong with you. What what, what 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 are you what are you missing? We ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, listen. If we if 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 we love one another, God lives in us. And God's love is made complete in us. Some of us got a lot of incompletes. All you students, y'all know what that is, amen. You know, you 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 don't finish an assignment. You don't fail it. You just got a incomplete. Mm -hmm. You're not a failure. You just you got some stuff to make up. Verse 13, this is how we know that we live in God and God in us. God has given us of God's spirit and we have seen and testified. The father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us. This is how love is made complete among us. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment in this world we are like jesus almost done verse 18 there is no fear in love but perfect love everybody say perfect love perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because God first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, listen, yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. I know some of y'all wish you never heard this passage, right? It's like, I, 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 I just want to start with Jesus' love. That's all I want to know about. Don't talk about nothing else. <laughs> Woo, this could not to mess up your life, don't it? Whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God. Whom they have not seen. And God has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister and everybody in between. Somebody say amen. amen. All our 
gender non-conformer folks, you in the spectrum of who's deserving of love. This is the word of God. This ain't Pastor Mike's word. For the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. We're going to preach on the topic, love made me do it. God bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. amen. Somebody holler, love, love. Made, me made me do it. Now, love is a, as I said last Sunday, a word that we throw around very cavalierly. We attribute it to things that are of the highest significance and of the lowest importance. I can love Peach Cobbler and in the same breath say, I love my mom and them. And I want you to know one is definitely more important than the other. But we will use the same word. The word usage does not always convey the significance of what we are trying to communicate. We talked last Sunday about the many ways that love is translated in the Greek. That eros is a love that is romantic, that underscores the kind of uh, relational love that those who are in some kind of extended, romantic, booed up, partnered relationship. Mm -hmm. Eros, filio, is the love that is often grounded in friendship, family. Agape is a love that is very much described and attributed as the highest form of unconditional love that is first expressed to us by God, and in return, we are constantly reflecting that back to God. One is unconditional, one is familial, and one is relational, if you will. All of these forms of love have a particular mutuality that must underscore it if it is to be healthy. That no love can be one way and be healthy. It is hard to love someone that does not love you back in return. Amen. It's not impossible, but it's hard. Because a certain kind of love is often feeding the love that is being drawn upon. Now, many of us, in the course of our lives, we will have strained relationships. And sometimes, the best love that we can offer some of our family members, loved ones, is distance. But it can still be healthy and life-giving. That love need not require harm in order to be real or in order to be felt, love can always be life-giving. I read this passage of scripture, you may be familiar of it, familiar with it, 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, verse 4 through 8. Often when we are doing uh, ceremonies of marriage or life partnership, and it is a very familiar passage of scripture that comes out of Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, and it defines love to me in one of the most beautiful ways. It is exhaustive. It forces all of us, if we were, to take out a checklist to describe or to define or to take inventory of how good our love is. You ought to take these 10 or so things and see, <laughs> are you passing? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. 
Love is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Love never fails. So no matter how the love made me do it. Love is what is to cause your patience to be long and not short. Love is what is to cause you to be soft and gentle with kindness and not harsh. Love is what is to cause you to not be a hater. Overwhelmed with envy. Love is what is to cause you to not be someone who is so proud and braggadocious of your accomplishments. Love is what is to cause you to not be stuck up and proud. Love is what is to cause you to not harm and minimize other human beings. Love is what is to cause you to not be someone who always is looking for your own self-interest. Love is that which is supposed to keep you from getting angry too fast. I ain't telling you you ain't going to get angry. Because anger is a part of our human constitution. But you ain't supposed to get angry about everything. All the time. You just angry. You wake up angry. You go to sleep angry. You show up to your job angry. You go home angry. You get home from work angry. You go to bed angry. You play basketball, you angry. You walk the lake, you angry. Love is that which is supposed to take the edge off your anger. Mm -hmm. Love is that which keeps you from keeping a laundry list of the ways you've been wronged. Love does not celebrate when evil is winning. Love wants to take seriously the truth is out there and you stand with truth. Love protects. Love elicits trust. Love does not run out on hope. Love stays on a hard journey. Love does not lose. This is the way Love at its highest expression. For we who follow the ways of Jesus ought to hold ourselves in some accountability. It ought not be I love compared to your kind of love. So, so you know, I, I you know, I love I I I I I love uh uh better than you. No. Our love is not to be cheapened by what about isms? What about they not know our love is not conditional in this way? It may show up conditionally, but there are moments where we are called into account about how deep is our love. How consistent it is our love. And this, beloved, is such a necessary challenge for the follower of Jesus living in a world characterized by war, hatred, violence, because we always have a choice about how will we show up 
amidst the backdrop of hatred, of violence, and of war. Jesus was not someone who came to the world in its perfection. Jesus showed up in a broken world and asked all of the disciples and those who heard his messages to lean into a way of being that did not drag them into death. Even though Jesus understood that if I live this way, death may come visiting me. And this is the power of Jesus, though, is that Jesus defeats death, hell, and the grave and tells all of us that you can defeat death, hell, and the grave. Now, it is not lost on me that death, 35-something thousand individuals killed in Gaza, 70-something thousand maimed. It is not lost on me that other parts of the world are drowning in violence. It is not lost on me that even in our own communities, we have a disproportionate presence of violence that is, I believe, a result of desperation and, and badly formed individuals who have been overexposed to trauma and lack, and some perhaps even teetering on the brink of psychosis. It's not lost on me that in the midst of all this talk about resurrection, we are constantly being reminded of the presence of death. This is not a Jedi mind trick. It is not a cheap kind of way to resolve that which is not resolvable. It is a way of inviting us into believing and certainly being convinced that in the face of death, death, although it seems to be permanent for the follower of Jesus, we believe it is not. There is not only life after death, but there is a way of life before death. That if fully embodied can lessen death. There are people, there are folks, I never forget all these places and spaces where I've had to counsel with mothers and fathers and friends who've lost children to death, what in my mind would seem early. And never forget the questions, why did God take my baby? And there is no theological class I've ever taken to give an adequate answer to that question except to say that I don't know why your child has left this earth this way. But I do know that there are ways that we can live where more children need not go this way. That our responsibility as people who follow Jesus is to be agents of life that emerges from love. Again, not a abstract description of love, but a very concrete, a very tangible, theologically a very incarnational, way of love, a love that emerges when we say love is patient. Every day you are patient with someone, you are sowing a seed of life through love. Every day you are kind, you are sowing a seed of life through love. Every day you are lacking the braggadocious, proud, Hateristic ways of culture, you are sowing seeds of life through love. Dare I say, you are investing in a life style rather than continuing to leave the world as it is. This is why I am someone who appreciates the divestment 
the consistent divestment sensibilities of these resistance moments and movements. Because as Sister Moni said, divestment from war campaigns, the war economy has consistently been a way to cripple the presence of violence in the world. When we become more conscious of how our financial dollars, that which we love, <laughs> somebody say amen. amen. So y'all love your money. We love our money. I know we don't want to say it, but we demonstrate it. Often we love our money. That which we love, how can that which we love become a source of death for those we also claim to love. Now this divest from the war machine, I pulled this from uh, the uh, war, uh, let, let's see, it's uh, worldbeyondwars.com. You can go to this and find all kind of wonderful information. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I joined what is called the Quincy Institute. It is one of uh, the foremost uh, policy think tanks in the country that is working to uh, reduce the footprint of military spending in our world. It is a bipartisan group of individuals. They heard me give a speech uh, one day about the uh, need to demilitarize law enforcement locally, which was being militarized due to the surplus war equipment in the Defense Department, that many local police departments now have tanks and have rifle snipers or, or scopes and have all this military equipment that gets sold to local de uh, police departments to help the Defense Department not have surplus equipment. And in some of these uh, contracts, the local police departments are required to use the equipment within six months or they have to send the equipment back to the Department of Defense. And so for instance, I've been going to 49er games most of my life, and I love the 49ers. It's the cheaper kind of love, somebody say amen, although when they lost, it did not feel cheap. <laughs> Nevertheless, it has been fascinating to me how over the last certainly since the Ferguson uprising, when you go to a game now, you often will see an armored, militarized vehicle that's sitting out there at the game with some folks who may have some rifles and things. And I, I, I started to think about this. I said, there was a time I could go to a football game and not see that. And I began to realize that in our everyday lives, we are often not aware of how our investment in militarized equipment is becoming normalized for us. Now in this particular season where our students and so many are calling for the divestment, I thought I'd show you this graphic that just captures how much money get spent on wars from the beginning of our country's history. This is a fascinating graphic. You may not be see, able to see it all that well, but $1.6 billion was spent in the War of 1812. I didn't know we had that much money back then, but I, I know <laughs> why we did, because there was you know, some folk out there picking cotton and tobacco. Somebody say man, Free labor, helping to pay for wars. 2.4 billion in the Revolutionary War, 2.4 billion in the Mexican War, 9 billion in the Spanish-American War, 79 billion in the Civil War, 102 billion in the Persian Gulf War, 334 billion in World War I, 341 billion in the Korean War, 600 billion in Afghanistan, 730 billion in Vietnam, 810 billion in Iraq, 1.4 trillion billion spent since 9-11, 4.1 trillion in World War II. It is a matter of fact that 
For the history of our country's existence, we have been in war for all but about 10 years of our 250 years of existence. I read in a, a paper that said that the, the, the United States influence across the world has not been through our ideals or through our democratic principles, but it has been in our ability to export organized violence. This you know, one former Republican, you know, is not like a progressive, a woke person. Because there was a time when military spending was a bipartisan critique. Now it is a bipartisan support in a country that wants to claim it is Christian. So how can we say we love God who we can't see? But we hate our brother and sister who we do see. How is it that we can say we follow the Prince of Peace when we can be so committed to war? How can we say we follow the one who came to set the captive free, but we only see captivity and incarceration and punitiveness as a response to human weakness and frailty. We must be a people who begin to ask ourselves, what is love asking of me in such a broken world? And why is it important for us to think of my investment into love and my divestment from violence? These campaigns, according to this document, very powerfully says that divestment withdraws investments from weapons, companies, and military contractors at the individual, institutional, and governmental levels. It is to say that much of our tax dollars that are spent in the war economy are not just spent on troops who are in our families disproportionately, but many of the dollars are spent on companies with CEOs that aren't accountable to our values. It gives you and I agency to act. So no matter if the Congress, no matter if the president, no matter if the political systems are gridlocked, we always have a way to say, I can divest. I can say no to war. I may not be able to stop it, but I can say no to it. How many of you know that sometimes all you can do is say no? You may not be able to stop the worst conditions, but you can say, no, I will not participate. In the immortal words of Cat Williams, did he want to party? But sometimes you got to say, no, I'm not going to party. I'm not doing this. Tell your neighbor, you got to tell him no. And some of us are too willing to keep saying yes. Hello, somebody. I'm, I'm, I'm just making you laugh to keep you from crying. Because we can get really worked up about other people's complicity and get real theoretical about our own. Oh, you know, Pastor Mike, I got to live. It's a very complicated world. I'm living on the edge myself. Oh, yes, you are. We are all living in a very vulnerable and vicarious world. Do you not know what it means to be human is to be contingent, subjected to whims. And yet, as a follower of Jesus, we say that there is some method to this madness. Why? First point is because God loved us first. I want you to think about this, beloved. What does it mean for you and I to be convinced that I have been loved by God? That in all the ways we've just described love, love is patient, love is kind, love is, does not uh, glory in, the, in evil, love is, 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 is persevering and love does not fail. In all of these ways I've described love, that I am 
first a recipient of that love from God. That God loves you first. Because God loved you first, you ought to love your neighbor. Can you, beloved, embrace the love of God that has been extended to you, to us, to the world? And I want to boldly say that for many of us, we have been taught so much through the course of our life that we are not loved by God. We're not pretty enough. We're not smart enough. We're too gay. We're too incarcerated. We're too uh, rich. We're too poor. We're, we, 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 we've made too many bad decisions. We're, we're too this and we're not loved by God, but I want you to know the highest form of God's love is unconditional. It is not contingent on you God loves you so generously that often God's love makes you love God back. <laughs> you know, ever been won over by the love of God? You know, ever, ever been so lavishly touched by God's love that it elicits a response from you you did not know was possible? Love. Love is God's first activity toward us. And it did not require you reaching to God first. For God so loved us, God gave. God initiated this love story with you. And God keeps coming back to us to remind you, I love you. I love you. I love you. First set of questions, beloved. Do you remember being loved by God the first time? Some of y'all can remember your love at first sight moment with your boo or with someone, you know, your first love, your puppy love. Some of you remember a song. How many got a song? Song come on, you'd be like, oh. In psychology, it's called an imprint. A permanent imprint in your mind. Takes you back to a moment in time. That rhyme, huh? Mm, right, got bars. Don't even be trying. I'm not as good as our resident poets, of course, but you know, comes out of me, you know, sometimes. But your psychology has imprints that are often a relation to your highest moments, your lowest moments. It could be a song, it could be a smell, perfume, cologne. Be like, oh man, taking me back. Some of us don't want to go back. Anybody ever been taken back to a place you don't want to go? You're like, mm -mm -mm -mm, no, 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 no. No, I, no, 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 I, I don't need to be back here. I'm trying to move forward. Do you have a first memory of God's love? I wonder if you'd spend some time in some prayer reflection and just thought to the first moment you realize, man, God loves me. And if you don't have that moment, I want to invite you to create a moment. By spending some time in the presence of God and let God's love penetrate you so deeply that you'll never forget. And on this day, this moment, I realized God loves me. Why is that important? Because you're going to be surrounded by people who's going to try to tell you the exact opposite. And I don't want your belief in God's love to be contingent on Pastor Mike, Pastor Tanisha, the way I want you to have a convincing, bone-deep experience of love from God that serves as a spring of love to others because if I can love others the way God has loved me then I believe that I can show up in ways second point this is a, this is a great one 
I can show up in the world in ways that make me bold for righteousness amidst adversity. Now, I love this verse. It says, for love has been perfected among us in this. Love has been perfected among us in this. Which is to say that you and I can possess love, but love often has a process of perfection. Which is to mean that you can learn to love better. Oh, this is how I am. Well, that's great, but you don't have to stay that way. I learned love. I received love this way. I learned love with a very 10% kind of uh, perspective, and, and that's all I have to give. No, beloved, your love can be perfected. Pat yourself on the chest and say, my love can be perfected. You can learn to love people better. Through the love that God has shown to you. There were times when I thought I loved people the best that I could, and that may have been true, but the more that I bathed in God's love, I start to realize that I can love you better. I can treat you better. I don't have to exist in the world with the best love that I received. How many of you can be honest and say, I received love, but it wasn't the best. Sometimes your parents and them love you the best they way, the best way they know how. Loving my trying to love my children, I realize, Lord, I just pray. God, may all the love I'm trying to give may it be received in a way that does not cause harm. Because you just don't never know. But the more you live, you begin to realize, man, that was not love. It might have been meant to be love, but that was not love. Why must our love be perfected? Because, beloved, when you learn to love folks better, when you learn to have better patience and have better kindness, this is, this is good to me. It gives you boldness in the face of adversity. Now, love, beloved, when done well, will often put you at odds with the forces that are not driven by love. Love is not all everybody to be like, oh, Jesus was Jesus' love. Why? Whoa. If Jesus was love the way we think of love, the way we reduce love, why would Jesus end up on a cross? If everybody loves love, oh, we love love. Love, we love it. But how many of you know that sometimes love with those who are vulnerable will put you at odds with the powerful? When you love unhoused people as a vulnerable group, it will be very hard for you to support laws that criminalize homelessness which then will put you at odds with the very lawmakers who are trying to criminalize homelessness. When you love Palestinian people as a vulnerable group, it will put you at odds with those who are willingly fueling aggression and violence that is causing them harm. When you love Pookie and them, are you getting my drift here? Because there's always a way where you can say, oh, I love them, and then you go home and you don't care how their lives are being destroyed by our cavalier love. I love them like I love the Lakers before LeBron joined. I get an emotional, you know, oh, they lost, you know. Although I've been comforting since the 49ers lost, so y'all pray for me, praise God, because a little too, too, too deep of a love connection there. But you know, when, when, you, when, when, when you love something that's, as a fan, it's very different when you love someone and are concerned 
And is not this the way that we are asked to love? Love gives you and I boldness for the right things in the face of adversity. When the scripture says on the day of judgment, it is your day of testing. Love ought to be a fuel that sustains you in your day of testing. So my question for you today, where does your love for what is righteous and just create adversity? To follow Jesus, I want to invite us. Are there ways that we can show up in solidarity, fueled by love that comes from God, that when we face adversity, we do not wilt? We do not retreat. And can we also see, this is another good question, how does adversity produce a more perfect love? Could you see adversity to be a sharpening of the love that you have? God, I want to be more loving. I want to love folks better. What I've learned then is that sometimes and this will feed into my last point, my lack of love for the other is largely because of a lack of proximity, a lack of understanding their journey or their experience, and a narrative internalized by me of them. And I want you and I and we to embrace this idea that perfect love casts out fear. A love that is perfected, a love that is mature, a love that is growing, is a love that need not share space with fear. This is a hard lesson, it's a hard truth. Because there are lots of things in the world that rightly elicit fear. Violence elicits fear. Abuse elicits fear. Trauma. But I do believe, beloved, that there is the presence of the greatest force known to humanity. A love, listen, that moved God into action on our behalf. For God so loved that God gave. God the unmovable, incontrovertible, the God that was at the beginning was not moved toward us by retribution, by vengeance, by power, God was moved toward us by love. And I believe that that love can move everything. It can move your relationships. It can move our country. It can move this world. There is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear. I need us in the face of such challenge in our communities, our families, our culture. I need us to lean in a little bit more on love. Scratch that. Not a little bit, a lot. We must love. Love is not passive, though. Love don't let you just... Watch people get harmed and you do nothing. Love, I believe, is what allows many to show up and call for justice. Love is what allows many to show up for peace. Love is that which ought to cause us to speak truth to power. Love is that which ought to cause us to struggle with, how do I forgive and resolve conflict with my neighbor? with my partner, with my children, with my family members, in as much as I can do so. We may not get to a point of agreement, but we can remain in love. 
And can you imagine how better the world would be if we stayed steadfast in love? Love is not a result of my love for God. It is a result of God's love for me. And because God loved me first, I ought to love my brother, sister, loved one, and neighbor. Love makes us do it. It is not some ubiquitous philosophical commitment. I want you to know, beloved, that love as a force can inhabit your very life and cause you to love yourself, your neighbor, all of creation. Stand to your feet, everyone. Let's prepare to pray. Wrap the hand of someone if you don't mind. Oh God, we are a people who want to say thank you, Lord, that you loved us first. Thank you that you demonstrated your love for us. That while we were yet sinners, while we were yet in our open rebellion to the way of life, you invited us to join. While we were yet walking away from you, you still loved us and died for us. And so this love that moved you to action, I invite this love to take action in the life of the hand I'm touching. Lord, I touch my beloved loved one today because I believe you've given them to me today as a gift. I sit with them. I sit next to them. I wrestle and struggle with the words we read and heard today. But I stand in solidarity with them that, God, you can help us love one another better. I can love them with more gentleness. I can love them with more kindness. I can love them with more peace. I can love them with more truth. I can love them with more protection. I can love them with more kindness. Love is patient. I speak this love into the relationships of the one I'm touching their personal relationships, their familiar relationships, their relationships with their partner and their spouses and their families. I speak this love. May they receive it. I speak this love into their relationships in their communities, their political relationships, their relationships in relation to the people of the world. I speak this love. May they receive it. I speak this love in relationship to creation, to the stewarding of the planet you've been given, you've given us to take care of. I speak this love. I speak this love even to them in how they deal with their self. May they, God, love the hands they've been given, the hair and the feet and the lips and the shapes and the mind. May they not hate themselves, but may they love themselves as an extension of the love you first shown to us. And God, may they always know that you are in love with us, God. And that love catalyzes a love in return to not just you, but to all who we touch. Now lift those hands where you're standing. It's me, God, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father. It's not my sister or my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you. I need you, God, to teach me how to love better. I need you to give me a moment, God, where I can 
feel your love in ways that are undeniable. Give me a moment, God, where I can sense and know that your love unconditionally is at work in my life. I pray for this love that I must show in places of adversity, in solidarity with the suffering, when I must stand up for what is right, when I must lean into that God which causes me to be a champion for the underdog, when it requires me to welcome my incarcerated loved one back into the community, when it causes me to contend with my student, when it causes me to keep working with my child or my family members. God, I pray this love, God, will be indicative of the love you've shown to me and I receive it right now. Come on, just reach up and receive it. I receive this love. I receive it. I receive it in abundance, God. May this love well up in me from the inside and may it overflow, may it overflow, may it overflow, may it overflow, God, so anyone who's around me can be doused with this love, can be overwhelmed with this love. May it be so, God, today in the mighty name of Jesus. And so, God, I pray that your love that covers a multitude of sins and grievances, your love that casts out fear, your love that welcomes the stranger, your love that takes care of the immigrant, your love that visits the incarcerated, your love that cares for the poor and the suffering in our communities and in the world. May this love be a natural fruit of the Spirit. And may it happen in us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. So God, I want us to love this week in tangible ways. I just want to give you a few moments. You can meet us at the altar. You can meet us, stay in your seat. But I just want you to take about three to five minutes. And I just, we're going to dismiss in a second. But I just want us to get one or two things in our minds that we can say, this is what I'm going to do to love more intensely, more intently this week. Love will make me do this this week. The love of God will make me do this this week. If you want to sit and take some notes, if you want to come kneel at the altar, if you want to come get prayer and touch and agree, we, we won't stay here very long, but, but we will stay here just for a moment because I want you to be a love agent. I want you on your job and in your family. I want you to say, this is how I'm loving this week. This is how my love will show up this week. This is with who my love will show up this week. My love will be more patient this week. My love will be more kind this week. My love will be more persevering this week. My love will stand in solidarity with this suffering, vulnerable group this week. My love will be activated in this way. You may be here and you say, I just need to experience this love. Well, come on and let's, let's lay hands together. Let's touch and agree together that this love is not so far away that you can't receive it today in this moment, in this second. But this love is available. This love is available to you today.